I'm here today with Duncan Christie Miller. He is a ex Royal Marine of the Navy and he is founder of Future Life Today, a very innovative programme to help young people reach and the older generation reach their full potential. Duncan, do you want to introduce yourself? Certainly. Thank you very much, Alex. This is a great opportunity to be with you and to be with your audience today. And uh, I think it reflects very warmly on you having set it up and got the initiative to get uh, to get it going. So congratulations Thank on you. that. Um, the aim of uh, meeting with you today is to introduce you to some of the principles and ideas contained in Future Life Today. And <coughs> as Alex mentioned, the whole aim of the programme, which is web based, social media based, is to unlock your full potential. Now, I'm um, 74 years old at the moment, it's, it's 2018, and the sun is shining, the weather is good. I've had a, a, a brilliant life, I've had an extraordinarily varied career. I was a Royal Marine for 20 years, I then decided to leave. I think I had a sort of mini midlife crisis and wanted to find out really who I am. And Part of Future Life Today takes you from the question of who am I and helps you answer the question who I am. And it's a journey which lasts for the whole of your life. And my life, as I said, 20 years in the Royal Marines, I then set up with two other people, a container a shipping company, sold it. I then ran the financial services for Debenhams, the retail group, and then set up Christie Miller Limited and I've been running that as a personal development programme in the United Kingdom and indeed around the world. Um, I was born in Sri Lanka, Ceylon, lived in Singapore for many years with the Royal Marines. I was in the US Marines for nearly three years, based in America. I was a query to Prince Philip for three years, travelling around the world. And uh, I've been um, a global trotter. And all of these have been remarkably influential, great experiences in developing for me future life today. So my aim today is to give you a, a little insight into what this, this uh, consists of. Essentially, there are five component parts to it, and it spells the word AIMED, A-I-M-E-D. I will teach you how to activate your senses, how to activate yourself. Innovate, how to use your brain, how to be creative, how to motivate both yourself and other people, especially when you're trying to create a team. But I'm not content with just a team. What I'm always aiming to do is to create truly great teams. No man is an island. We work, we, work, we live in teams. And it's behold on, on all of us to know how to create a truly great team. And I've got some rather unusual ideas about the position of the leader, male or female, in relationship to the team. The E of AIM stands for how to educate yourself, how to continue to use your brain, how to study and how to use experiences, both good and bad, to give you positive results. And the D is dedication. And part of that is contained in the phrase mensana in corpore sanum, a healthy mind in a healthy body and there is a huge amount of evidence to support the fact that the physically fitter you are the mentally fitter you will be and when we talk about innovation and I explained a little bit about your brain you'll see the value of being physically fit <clears throat> so I hope that gives you an introduction to, to, uh, to what I do and what I passionately believe in and actually I, I do think uh, without over egging it I, I'm on a mission. I'm on a mission to help people to unlock their full potential, to be happy and to be successful. Great, that's a very informative introduction. Uh, I just want to go back to your background really. Um, what exactly uh, motivated you to join the Marines and what did you get out of uh, doing so? The motivation to join was uh, really threefold. Firstly, I did feel um, as a teenager a surprising degree of patriotism and I was brought up to believe in my country I was brought up to believe in a just war um, although that needs careful definition of what a just war is secondly I 
have always been uh, not an exercise freak, but I've always enjoyed being physically strong and fit. Uh, and that the, the Royal Marines certainly provided that. And lastly, was undoubtedly that they are the best military organisation I've ever come across. And if I was going to join the military, I'd like to join the best and be challenged by it. And it certainly fulfilled that requirement as well. And what was your experience like in America? Living in America with the United States Marines was, was, a, revel uh, was a revelation. First of all, for the first time ever, I was independent. Now that may sound contradictory, but I was the only British officer in the US Marines. And as a result, I was able to flex the system a lot. And I got myself posted to some very interesting places. I was, for the two and a half years, I was in an organization called Force Reconnaissance, which is the American Marines equivalent of the SEALs. And that's special forces, and they were undoubtedly the best of the bunch. They presented a big challenge. I had to learn a new language. And they also responded to me very warmly and giving me a lot of latitude to bring in perhaps some of my experiences and some of the flavour which I could bring to them. And I learned a lot from them. Um, their equipment is excellent. Uh, in that unit, the spirit was remarkable. And we did some very exciting things. Great, great. So what exactly did you learn out of the experience? Did you learn uh, a great deal about, uh, about leadership? Because I know you were head of recruitment for the Marines itself. I ran the officers' training, but that was after I'd been in the US Marines. I think the biggest learning lesson from working with the US Marines was a repeat, a reprise, of what I think I knew before, which is that the essence of all, all things is communication. And right. without communication, mainly face-to-face, -face, personal, but in the military, communication is often clouded by the fog of war or by distance, or by the fact that your enemy has got a better plan than you. And I, I learned, I relearned the lesson about communication. Do you feel like being in the Marines helped your business career after in merchant banking, for example? Yes, it did. Uh, my, my, the skills that you learn in the military, camaraderie, teamwork, communication, problem solving, are definitely of use in the business, in the business world. But without business acumen and without financial acumen, you're not going to succeed in business. You can get away with it in the military because the military essentially are not in, not interested. They are they don't stress financial acumen. Um, but you you've got to develop that skill. And when I left and in the container world and in Debenhams, uh, I did I really had a steep learning curve to learn some new skills. I found it really challenging, really exciting. And that's again one of the things I passionately believe in is that you never stop learning. And you learn, of course, from your failures more than you learn from your successes. As long as you're prepared to accept that a failure is not actually a disaster, it is a way station on the way to success. So there's no such thing as a failure, actually. It's just a success waiting to happen. So the phrase, win or learn, is, is very valuable. Totally. I think I wish I'd said that myself. <laughs> <laughs> so after your business career, mm. you founded Christy Miller. Am I wrong? Um, Correct. Christy Miller Limited is a consultancy and our strap line is creating the future. And here I wanted to get people to um, always look ahead, always be uh, amenable for themselves and for their, their team and their family and their, their firms to, to create what's next and to make an improvement on where they are now. So my my two boys who are now 50 years old and 48 years old, I think have been impelled in their life by the same principle, which is wherever they are, they want to make an improvement for themselves and for their organization. That doesn't mean to say you have to be um, a revolutionary and tear up the order book. It just means that you have to, you have to understand that everything can be improved. And indeed, I've written a thing called Defined 
quality management, which takes improvement in steps so that you're continually improving. And as an example, Beresford, who ran the uh, British Olympic cycling team, he adopted very similar ideas, which was you take everything that you do and you make small, minute improvements. And the cumulative effect is, is, is very big, but the, the actual switching of one thing and making it a tiny bit better is nearly minuscule, nearly not, not aware, you're not really aware of it. But cumulatively, the impact is tremendous. And for all those uh, nihilistic uh, people out there, mm. what is the point in improvement? Uh, you know, once you reach the end goal, um, people are often very depressed. For example, Michael Phelps, mm. who, you know, mm. I don't know how many gold medals he has now for the Olympics, says well, okay. when once he won, he sure. became uh, incredibly depressed and yeah. sad. Sure. What, what's your take on that? The take is this. The thing which impels all of us, drives all of us, is objectives. And objectives are psychologically absolutely imp imperative to us because when you achieve your objective you get a result and everything which I believe in, teach and indeed preach is, is practical, it's designed to get a result. Now I'll give you an example, uh, two years ago I trained very hard to do the London, a London to Brighton walk and I was getting out of bed at four in the morning I was walking 10, 12, 15, 20 miles, getting myself fit for it. I did it, it was very satisfying. But immediately I did it, I found myself unable to get out of bed at four in the morning because there was no um, impetus for me. I'd done it. So I had to set myself a new objective. Now you may not want to do more walking, I mean, that's just an example, but I chose, that was part of the reason why I felt a degree of frustration and part of the reason why I thought I need a new horizon, I need a new challenge and it's fu the, the new challenge is future life today. So I've, I've moved, that, in, that really encouraged me, it made me think, what, what now? What's the new challenge? So how did Christy Miller differ from Future Life Today? Uh, Christy Miller Limited was face-to-face -face training and development, coaching, uh, mentoring and running conferences, events all around the world and I've worked in the Middle East, in America and the Far East and part of the activity of Christy Miller Limited was running some fairly, um, fairly bold activities for people. For example, during, during the years I've, I've rented a, a Russian submarine for an activity. I, in America with uh, Kansas University at Lawrence I hired a train to do various things. Um, We've used helicopters, we've used boats, sailing. I mean, these are sort of big boys and their toys things, but they all had a very definite purpose to get a result. Teamwork, communication, leadership, problem solving. And indeed, in 2003, I, was, I helped the, the English rugby team to A, introduce them to the Royal Marines, not for physical training, but to understand the link between mental efficiency and physical efficiency and secondly I invented a thing called teacup thinking clearly under pressure um, which is, is something the military are, are very good at you have a plan but when you get into combat more than likely your plan ain't going to work because the enemy may have a better one so you have to think very very quickly and you often have to think getting information which is both corrupt and difficult to understand because you may not be able to see what the person is telling you and you so say you have to have a very clear ability to think clearly under pressure and that comes down to two words what and how Great. and when you're leading people and the best way to lead people is not by command and control it is by agreeing with them what you're trying to achieve and then knowing that they are professional enough and enthusiastic enough and innovative enough to work out how to do it. Because when you, unless you're at the running the gun or the bayonet, or you're at the, the counter in the shop, I can't tell you both what and how. I agree with you what is important, and then I trust you to work out how to do it. Right. I will criticize you, 
if you don't use your initiative because I can't tell you how to do it. Great, so you mentioned you had a, a kind of semi midlife crisis after you left the army. Yes. What, um, for anyone in a similar kind of situation mm. who's struggling with a mm. depression, anxiety, mm. or whatever, mm. uh, what advice would you give them mm. and how would you practically implement mm. the steps that you have in future life today okay. in, in, in you know, ten, you know, a minute? Okay. Um, first of all, acknowledge to your family and acknowledge to yourself that you're not going to put up with second best. Now, this is the whole development of who I am and who am I. And I began to realize that, that who I was, who I am, um, was slightly out of balance with some of the military diktats that I was having to live with. And essentially that came down to me to being, using the word, as I've used it once already, the word independent. And I needed to, to stand on my own two feet, not to be reliant on an infrastructure that was both very comfortable and challenging, but slightly restrictive. So the first thing, acknowledge that you have a need. It's not, I wouldn't call it a problem, but you have a need. Uh, and to do that, you have to acknowledge that you need help. You need advice. You need wise counsel. And I would look for people, systems, but mainly people who would actually guide me. Sometimes you can get that through books, and that's where future life comes into play. It's not books, it's videos, but I do try to help people who are, who've got a dilemma, have got a, a number of points where they could go left or right or center to make up their own minds. But part of that goes back to this spirit of independence, and I call it self-authorization. And you have to give yourself permission to do things. Because otherwise, you go through life um, making decisions which are narrowed by circumstance and by the environment you're in. So you always have one or two decisions which are made that options. But when you self-authorize, you create your own options as opposed to having them enforced by circumstances on you. And it's, a, for me, realizing that I could self-authorize was a huge leap into independence and creative thinking. And also, at the same time, <clears throat> fear of failure. Because if I was leaving the, in inverted commas, security of the Royal Marines, which, was, which is a bit of an oxymoron, um, you know, I had to make a success of it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have enough money, my family would suffer, and I would be, in inverted commas, a failure. So, you take a risk. But risks are not dangerous. Risks are when you assess the dangers, and something which is dangerous, don't do it. But something which is a risk, which you can assess the risk, and you've got the talent or the resources to overcome it, well, do it. Great. Alex, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for you giving me the time today with you. And I'd like to spend perhaps another 10, 15 minutes just outlining some of my really core beliefs and they're contained in future life today. But what I really want to introduce you to is this. And this is your brain. And it's an absolute tragedy that I was educated and nobody ever told me how my brain worked. And I've got a superficial knowledge of it. I've investigated it a little bit. But I'm, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist or anything but I know a little bit about the brain. And it is this amazing organ that runs our lives. And it behold us all to know a little bit about it. I'll come back to that later. Now, future life today, it does what it says on the tin. Your future life today. Today is the start of your future life. And every day is a recommencement. So when you wake up in the morning, it's the future today. That's why I've called it future life today. And the first part of the five-part process, A-I-M-E-D, is activation. <clears throat> and here we go into quite a lot of the psychology of attitudes. And indeed, if you go into the program and look at it, you can pull it down and you'll see that there is a list of positive and negative attitudes. When you wake up in the morning, every morning, you have a choice of attitudes. Now, if you don't adopt a positive attitude, you're, you're going to be neutral. 
you're going to be vanilla. And what will happen is that a little nibble will turn you into being negative. So you have to start adopting positive attitudes. And it could be as simple as being cooperative or being listening or being team oriented. But today, this is what I, who I am and this is what I'm going to be. The, the second part is understanding, as I mentioned earlier, about self-authorization, giving yourself permission to do things. And we live in a hierarchical society, families, schools, the military, businesses, churches are hierarchical. And you're always depending on somebody else's tick in the box, approval to do things. Well, that's both good and restricting. So as I said, without encouraging you to be difficult or obnoxious, I want you to start, I encourage everybody to self-authorize, to give themselves permission, and to start off doing it in very small ways, and then it becomes cumulative. <clears throat> The second part is how to innovate, and this is where your brain comes into, into play. Now, the brain is just amazing. You're a, you're a billionaire. Did you know that? <laughs> Did you know? I didn't know. There you are. You've got, <laughs> you've got about a, a, a hundred billion neurons in your brain. Now, a neuron is an end of a piece of wire, as it were, in your brain, and it's all connected. And you're never going to run out of connectivity. There is a myth that as you get older your brain ceases to function. That's not true. What happens is that you it's rather like a path through a wood. Unless you go down that path it'll become overgrown and the undergrowth will prevent you. So the more you use your brain the longer it will last. It will last forever. Now this little model here shows that, I don't know if you can see it, but there are two knobby bits here. If you touch the back of your head you'll see there are two knobby bits at the end. Those are your original brain that we had when we were slithering in the primordial mud. They're actually the sense of smell and your sense of flight or fly, or uh, fight or fly, um, contained here. Very basic, very instinctive things, and they lead directly into the spinal column. Contained inside the brain, because this is what we always think the brain looks like, the crinkly bit, but inside the brain is your simian brain. And this is what we had when we were monkeys. And above it is the modern brain, which is probably no, no more, uh, no older than about 15, 20,000 years. We really don't know. And the reason it's all crinkled is because our skull hasn't expanded at the same size, the same time as our brain. Our brains have got bigger, but our heads haven't. So it, it's been compressed. Now, People say, what, what do you know about your brain? And most people say, there's a left and a right. A left and a right. And that's true, but they're not exclusive. And for example, if you put your finger in your left ear, you'll bump into a thing called the amygdala. And the amygdala, which is Latin for, uh, Greek for almond, controls access to your emotional libraries. And imagine in your brain, you've got a series of libraries, <clears throat> reservoirs. And the amygdala sends a signal down to the, uh, the, the noise library. And so when you make a noise, it says that's threatening or that's friendly. Or it, it goes to, um, you, you see a pretty girl, and he says, yes, I, or, I like that, or I don't like that, or I like this smell. So and that's in the left-hand side. But there's an alternative and secondary amygdala in the right-hand side as well. But essentially, the left-hand side if you wanted to classify it as left and right, is control of logic, and the right-hand side is, the, is rhythm, emotion. But the connectivities are between the two. And joining the three brains together, you have a thing called the corpus callosum. And this is a, a nerve membrane, like a motorway bridge joining two sides together. And in women, it's much more developed than in men. And that means that women have an inherent desire to communicate. They perceive something, they experience something. I want to tell somebody. With men, it's not so well developed. So we tend to experience something, keep it to ourselves. Now, I've had my brain scanned, and I've got a rather feminine corpus callosum. 
and that probably explains why I enjoy doing what I enjoy because I experience something and I am curious and that prompts me to want to explain it and understand it and curiosity without curiosity our brains don't function now we have five senses there may be a sixth sense but without curiosity they don't come alive and one of the self-authorization techniques is to be curious and I teach people every day of their lives to go to bed having said every day of their lives that's interesting now you're sitting on a sofa opposite me it's interesting that you've chosen to adopt that posture that's interesting why are you sitting like that why are you wearing the clothes you're wearing why am I wearing what I'm wearing you know that's curious and we should go through life continually saying that's interesting and then interrogating it not just accepting it so that's the second that's the very brief introduction to innovation here's your brain 100 billion connections you're never going to run out of brain power motivation motivation is very simple everybody wants to get results so achieve a result do it in a team for the individuals who are you have a personal relationship with and collectively do it to the group as well and what this actually means is that in a team when you're trying to motivate a team you shouldn't have a team that's really no that's bigger than six or seven people to reach out to more than that is very difficult to have a personal and a team relationship at the same time and one of the problems in, in business and indeed in all spheres of life is that people think bigger is better where teams are concerned not true five six seven people in a team is perfect and then you, 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 you cascade it down so that you get a, um, uh, a pyramid effect, as it were. But remember that the leader in a team is not actually at the top of the pyramid. It's the reverse pyramid. The leader is actually at the bottom. Because without, as it were, the private soldiers, without the workers, the leader is nothing. So he or she is providing a service upwards and these people above you are more important than you. So you serve to lead. And you have a contract, which is, I will agree with you what we're trying to achieve. And as part of that, I will provide you with the very best leadership service. And we work together to achieve our objectives. So setting the objectives understanding that you're providing a service gives you the contract between the leader and the led and part of that contract indeed is that if somebody in your team steps out of line part of the service is you're prepared to discipline them because if you don't the rest of the team will become very very annoyed with you because other people they're working hard other people are getting away with it so Leadership is not about being a soft, a softy. It's about providing that balance between objectives, discipline, process, plans, and being a professional. You, but you, the last being really important, you have to know your profession. So then we get to how we, we educate ourselves. And this is a whole question of lifelong learning. And I intend to, to die with an open book on my bed so or listening to a radio and saying that's interesting and i really would encourage everybody to regard travel as an educational experience um, wealth is nothing to do with money wealth is to do with the quality of your experiences and that's where you should spend money on gaining experience um, and every time you if, if you go on a tube train you go on a bus it's a journey and you'll learn something from it. It's continuous education. So 50 times a day, that's interesting. I'm using curiosity. Education, continuous improvement. And lastly, dedication. And this comes back to being dedicated to the, the um, philosophy of a healthy body, mensana in corpore sana, a healthy mind in a healthy body. And 
without, for example, the brain works on oxygenated blood coming from your lungs, flowing through your brain, the better oxygenated blood you've got in your lungs, the better your brain will work. The brain actually runs on electricity, tiny amounts of electricity. Perhaps at school, you stuck a thing in an orange and it, it turned a bulb up. I think we did, yeah. yeah. And how does an orange have electricity in it? Amazing. But in the brain, that's exactly what's happened. The brain is, 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 uh, is, is creating electricity, tiny amounts, and it allows the neurons to fire and connect with each other. But the lubricant is oxygenated blood. It also, the brain is surrounded by saline water too, uh, rather like salt water, a very small amount, very good conductor of that tiny bit of electricity. So you, you need to drink a lot of water. People say you need to drink two litres a day. Well, I don't know if that's true, but uh, we should all drink slightly more water than we do. It's it really is the the best drink in the world and lots of salt as well <laughs> not no, too much salt. no no i think if i disagree with that no you'll oh, get yes. you'll get quite enough salt in your diary in your in your daily uh, activities and taking salt tablets will actually sit in your stomach and not not do good um the best hydrate best drink to rehydrate you is actually water with a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. And you don't need to go and buy commercial brands of stuff. Just get a bottle, water, a little bit of sugar, and a little bit of salt, shake it up, and that's perfect for you. Right, yeah. So I can save you a lot of money on that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So being, being dedicated goes back in the circular to this whole question of, of self-authorization. If I self-authorize, I will have an objective, and I will be dedicated to making various improvements. They'll be mental, they'll be physical, and I use the word spiritual as well. Nothing to do with religion, but to do with the, the spirit that we all have, which propels us and gives us motivation. And we all have an internal voice. We talk to ourselves. Well, who are you talking to? It's your spirit. Nothing to do with religion at all. But us human animals have this amazing capacity to have an alter ego. And we speak to that person. And the internal person and the external people need to be integrated so that you are not competing with each other or the, the internal voice is saying you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or it's dangerous or, ri or too risky. So you need to, by self-authorization and dedication, you go from saying, who am I, to understanding who I am, and then understanding what your capabilities are and how you rise to challenge and achieve success. But success, let me finish on by saying this to you, success is not how rich you are, what a car you've got. Success is how you behave, how you conduct your life how you continue to improve, how you relate to other people, how you communicate. And success is truly understanding who you are and achieving your, unlocking your full, your full potential. Yours, your unique potential. Nothing to do with other people, me, people you know, but how can you uniquely, individually, unlock your full potential and achieve your very best results. Great. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank for you. Interview. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.